I'd first like to thank Steve for the invitation to speak, as well as Kate Four for uh, doing a lot of logistics in the background to, uh, to allow myself and uh, the four superstar undergrads to speak today. Uh, so I'll be talking about synthetic biology research, and the main goal from this talk will be uh, hopefully letting you know what I mean by synthetic biology. So briefly, uh, the outline of what I'd like to cover today, although I'm not wedded to this outline, before I start, I'd like to say if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me and ask. If you're doing me a big favor, it's often hard to uh, take this very uh, high level approach for giving a talk, and I'm new at this, so you'll be helping me out by interrupting me and asking questions as we go. And I'll uh, adapt the talk accordingly uh, to your questions. So first I thought to cover uh, what, what and why do synthetic biology. So what is synthetic biology and why do it? And I think it's really easiest to understand when uh, you look at examples of current synthetic biology applications. So I'll cover some of those. And then we'll transition into this undergraduate competition, iGen, in the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, which is a fancy word for synthetic biology uh, competition. I'll give some example projects that undergrads have done uh, in the past to give you an idea of uh, how exciting it is that undergrads can really drive these projects themselves, get their hands wet, and do the research uh, by themselves with modest advising from, from older people like myself. But it's really the undergrads that push that program. And that's why the undergrads will be talking about next what their project was to give you a flavor for uh, what their experience was. And then we'll definitely, at the end, the most important part of the talk will be answering questions you may have. So we'll make sure that we have time for doing that. OK, so what is synthetic biology? Uh, Synthetic biology's aim is to harness cells for useful applications. So the first question is, why cells? Why would we want to harness them? The first reason is that they're capable of amazing behaviors. So this is a movie of a neutrophil, which is part of our immune system. Their job is to uh, sense and then attack invaders. So in this case, a small bacterium. So somehow that neutrophil is able to sense that bacterium and where that bacterium is swimming. And it's so good at that that it's able to even overtake the bacterium. Let's see if I can say that again. I'm amazed every time I see this, uh, this video. So these round spherical objects are red blood cells. So you can see that the neutrophil doesn't care about the red blood cells. It's not sensing those, or at least it's not responding to those. Its motility or movement is specific only to that bacterium. So you imagine that very sophisticated computation might be occurring in that cell to enable it to be able to specifically sense that bacterium and respond accordingly. So we'd like as scientists to understand how that's accomplished, and then as engineers, we'd like to mimic that behavior. There are many other enviable properties uh, or abilities that cells have that we'd also like to harness. So we just went over that neutrophil movement, which has amazing information processing that we still don't understand all the details for how that's accomplished, but we're beginning to understand. So we'd like to uh, further study that, as well as other sensing. Uh, you imagine that uh, cells in your body need to be able to respond to what other cells in your body are doing, or uh, microbes, single cell organisms, have to rapidly adapt to their environment as their environment is changing. There, there's uh, a remarkable ability to both sense those inputs and then do signal processing or computation to decide how we can respond to that environmental cue or input, and then what we call actuate or execute some response to that input. So we'd like to be able to mimic that behavior or even take, uh, harness that. Also, cells, as you're probably aware, are capable of metabolizing uh, different sugars, different inputs. 
So I'm going to, by metabolism, I mean the ability to catalyze reactions. So if you're probably familiar from your organic chemistry classes, uh, in the past that, uh, that there's a whole science towards making materials that we've now figured out how to do certain reactions. Well, a cell can do this with extremely uh, high precision. And there's many uh, things that the cell can do chemistry-wise that we can't come close to at the bench of organic chemistry. And that can be in two different forms, anabolic, or the scientific term, making stuff. Uh, you're probably familiar with anabolic steroids in the news for sports, uh, which is basically making lots of muscle. But we could also use anabolic pathways to make molecules of interest, such as biofuels, so sustainable uh, production of molecules we can put into our gas tanks. Commodity chemicals, such as polymers that go into making carpet or tiles or synthetic wood uh, products, pretty much almost everything in this room, the seeds, uh, vinyl. Imagine if we could use cells to make those materials. So that we're not using uh, fossil fuels as currently done, but we could use uh, green plant material as our, our feedstock, feed those to our cells, and have the cells do this complex chemistry inside the cell to produce our molecules of interest. That would be a much more environmentally friendly way of doing, uh, of synthesizing these molecules. Also, uh, the opposite of anabolic pathways are catabolic pathways, breaking down stuff. So this would be like breaking down, uh, uh, breaking down pollutants. So you might have a pollutant in the environment. Can you engineer a cell to pick up that pollutant, do chemistry inside the cell to convert that pollutant into some molecule that's benign, or better yet, a molecule that we could actually use to make the carpet or to, uh, to drive our, our car, etc. Or biomass. Can we grow uh, plant material like, let's say, switchgrass, and then convert that plant material into a fuel that we can put in our car and burn? The second the second reason uh, we like to study cells and harness cells' abilities is that they have a remarkable ability to self-replicate. So that's uh, a property of living material that you can make many copies of itself. So if you engineer your cell to be able to, uh, let's say, make a biofuel, you have that single cell, but then you can quickly make many, many copies of that, that factory, that cell, to do the reaction that you you desire. So you can rapidly amplify uh, your, your systems. Okay, so I, I kind of danced around this, but there's two main goals of synthetic biology. So the first is, as we've been discussing, being able to perform useful functions or applications, such as making the biofuel. And that's a, a huge part of synthetic biology. The second aim of synthetic biology is to also understand better how cells naturally work. So we often quote this, this famous uh, line from Richard Feynman, what I cannot build, I cannot understand. So if we really truly understand how a cell is working, then we should be able to reconstitute that and build it back up from, from the ground up. And if we can't do that, then we probably don't really understand. It's probably missing some component uh, that's important for function. So, I'd like to draw the analogy of uh, uh, doing synthetic biology, or you may have heard the terms genetic engineering, to a computer. So, you're probably familiar in a computer that uh, you have to write the program that you want in, the, want the computer to execute in a language the computer can understand. And then that will be coded as binary zeros and ones. And the computer can then actuate or execute that program. So much in the same way, a synthetic biologists have to put in the program they want to be run in a language the cell can understand. And we code that in DNA uh, bases, so A's, G's, C's, and T's. 
And then the cell recognizes that coding and that, that program to then execute it. So living cells have their natural programming all encoded in these A's, G's, C's, and T's, which we call the genome. So you probably uh, are well, are very familiar with the sequencing the human genome project that happened about a decade ago. So that simply means reading all those A, C's, G's, and T's to understand what the, to see what the blueprint of the cell is. Now there's a big jump from knowing what the blueprint is to being able to read all that programming. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done on that, but it's a very exciting ability now that we have that's fairly recent, just a decade old, to be able to know what that blueprint is. Uh, and that has expanded to many other organisms besides just our, uh, just our own. So now we'd like to take those blueprints and then go the opposite direction and put in our own program, again encoded in the DNA bases, so that we can then boot up that programming in our cells of interest. So how is the genome read then? This is uh, called central dogma, and I oversimplified it here, but I think, uh, I think it'll at least give you a, a feel for what's going on in the cell. So the cell will have its DNA, drawn here in blue, and then there's machinery in the cell that reads that DNA and does what's called transcription. It converts the DNA into RNA, and then that RNA is then converted into protein by a process called translation. So it's not important to remember all these details. I really just want you to get that DNA is then read to produce protein, and proteins, for the most part, are the machinery that actually does the work for the sensing and signaling metabolism that we talked about. So as I said, proteins do most of the work. Uh, they're able to catalyze chemistry in the cell that far exceeds what we can do uh, as organic chemists at the bench. So we really like to harness uh, this catalytic ability of enzymes. The best of these enzymes can catalyze reactions up to 10 to the 7th per second. So you think about that. 10 to the 7th reactions are happening every second in the cell. Uh, with, these, uh, with these best enzymes. Also, signaling. So to produce that, that uh, directed motility, that movement of the neutrophil I showed you in that first movie, somehow the cell is able to sense an environmental input, and that black box is somehow is proteins. So you have receptors at the, uh, at the membrane of the cell that separates the outside from the inside. And that receptor is able to bind environmental input, and when it binds, and only when it binds, does it produce a signal that it's able to relay from protein to protein until ultimately it produces the appropriate cell response. Often that response is expression of other proteins. So you might want to produce uh, a protein that, protein that catalyzes a, a new reaction that will give you uh, resistance to, to a molecule that's in your environment. Or, uh, uh, so to do that, then many proteins are involved in being able to read the DNA and be able to uh, DNA or RNA and produce other proteins to do still more responses. So the only basic thing I want to get across from this slide is that the DNA encodes for protein, and then protein can do a wide variety of different tasks, uh, or different behaviors in the cell. Um, question. Sure. Well, in the example you just showed us, um, we're not creating new proteins. We want the thing to move in the right direction. Right. To catch the right. Right. So that's very different. Right. So in that in that uh, example, there's this signaling that controls our what's called cytoskeleton, which is other proteins that give rigidity to the cell. And the cytoskeletal proteins themselves can polymerize, so it can form long filaments. By that process of polymerization, it 
pushes the cell forward. That has a dramatic oversimplification because there's a lot of other factors that are involved in that facility, which is why I chose it as an example, because it's so sophisticated. Uh, but much of the work is done by these other proteins that can be either soluble, floating around, or polymerized to form force. After that first uh, series, after the uh, cell captures that was it a bacteria, whatever it was, the fragments. Yes. Um, what then? So, uh, if you notice at the end, the cell didn't have any motility at the very end. It just kind of hangs out for a little bit, and then eventually, another bacterium would come across its path. It would sense that and start moving towards towards it. So I think there's also, in the sophistication, it's able to lock on that one bacterium and follow it, and it's ignoring everything else. But once it engulfs that bacterium, it doesn't really know what to do for a little bit, it resets. So it would depolymerize those filaments, and it would go back to its, its basal state, its normal state, until it gets excited again by another target. Whatever the... Um Materialist that it just captured. Does it just stay there? Oh, that, the what's the fate of that bacteria? Uh -huh. Oh, it, do the proteins do something to it? Yeah. So, so once it's engulfed, it kills that bacteria. It uh, breaks it apart. So other proteins are involved in that as well. Let's catch up. Yes, catch up. A lot of catabolism is done. Exactly. Okay, so uh, so now we have we so now we have, want to be able to boot up our own programming. So we make our programs. That's what the synthetic biologists do uh, at the bench, and we make our DNA that's in the right language, and then somehow we put those into these cells, and the cell has all the machinery that it can boot up that program and execute hopefully our desired. Our desired function. So I'll give you a, a brief flavor. These details aren't, aren't critical to understand, but I'll give you a brief flavor of how this is actually done at the bench. So we'll have our microbe. In this case, I have a cartoon of an E. coli cell, which I'll go into a little more detail in a minute. Uh, and then we have our DNA, a circular piece of DNA that we call a plasmid. So the plasmid has all the machinery that it requires to be able to make several copies of itself inside the cell and uh, has the programs to express the protein that uh, we all encode in our genes or our DNA on the plasmid. So we make the plasmid at the bench and then we insert it into our bacterium, E. coli, by a process called transformation. So basically, I just want to get across that we can make our DNA and then we can put it into the bacteria. How we make that piece of DNA is we'll start with the plasmid. We have proteins, enzymes, that very specifically will cut certain sequences. So we can cut only where we want to cut the plasmid. And then this cute example, we want to teach the cell, tell the cell, turn red. So we're going to put in another piece of DNA that goes for a protein called red fluorescent protein. So if this gene is expressed, then it will produce red fluorescence. So we cut that uh, gene that, that encodes for red fluorescence with the same enzyme to make the same ends DNA cuts that our plasma will have. So that, using that, then we can then put that red fluorescent protein gene into our plasma. And we use another enzyme that sews it all together to make a now continuous circle piece. It's all enclosed as one contiguous piece of DNA that now encodes for our red fluorescent protein. So we transform that plasmid into our bacterium. It will express our red fluorescent protein. This is the structure of that red fluorescent protein. And then with time, the cell will get more and more red. So you can actually see colonies of these cells. So each of these circles is uh, is many, many E. coli cells growing, growing right next to each other. So each colony was a single cell 
that got onto our plate here, and then they multiplied until we could visibly see them as a circle. So then, synthetic biologists will take that genetic engineering, the ability to make, uh, to be able to express red fluorescent protein, and now we add in sophistication. So it's not important to understand what this cartoon is doing, I, uh, the details of it. I just included it to show that we can now control, we can add in other elements to make this expression more stable. So we, this circuit is called a toggle switch, which behaves just like the light switch, where it can be either off or on, but you'll never get intermediate it's not that has no dimmer. It won't be half on or half off. It will either be all the way on or all the way off. And it accomplishes this just by simply making repressors that will turn off expression of, of another repressor. So if you have expression, expression of one repressor, that will turn off expression of the other, and so on. So you can induce RFP be all the way on or all the way off by adding this to the next circuit. So again, it's not important to understand the details of this. I just want to give you a flavor of what you can start building into the cell to get the, the desired behavior. And I included this one particularly because in 2000, uh, Gardner and Collins made this toggle switch, and it was really one of the first uh, efforts of synthetic biology. So this is when we really started realizing around 2000 that we could take this approach uh, forward. So I would say synthetic biology was really born around 2000 with uh, this first demonstration. But to build these sophisticated circuits, you need to have a lot of parts. But one of the efforts that uh, was started early on by MIT was to make a registry of standard biological parts. And this is a website that you can go to and you can actually order many different types of parts. So you have parts for making, making chemicals, and for uh, biosafety, for controlling whether your cell lives or dies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So many different types of parts. And this is important because, just like with the computer, you want to be able to go to Radio Shack and be able to pull out parts off the shelf and know that any one part can function with another part, so you can combine them together like Legos. If you uh, can't have this ability to be like a, a Mac computer, where the Mac's great if it, if it works and you have a Mac store, but if it breaks, you have to take it to the Mac store. You can't just go to Radio Shack and take a, a part off the shelf and plug it in. Uh, you really, as a field, we saw we want to be able to have as much as much standardization as possible so that we can just take parts from what other people have done and plug it in with other parts that we have made. So we don't always know beforehand what the final destination of each of these parts is going to be. So maybe another way of thinking about this is the example of a uh, screw, where you can make screws with uh, different heights of ridges or different lengths between these ridges. Uh, and the screw would work, but it wouldn't work with other prefabricated materials. You really ideally want to be able to buy a screw from a uh, hardware store in San Francisco and be able to use it with uh, a nut or that you bought in Boston, for example. So you want to have confidence that each of these parts will go together. Even though when they are both manufactured, the manufacturers didn't know that you were going to put these two parts together necessarily. So to do that, the uh, internet there was an international standard for the thread size and pitch diameter that was built, so that no matter what device you're building, these screws will work with those prefabricated materials. So we'd like our biological parts to be built in the same way. So we, as much as possible, can put any one part together with any other part and still expect them to function together. Okay, so I gave you that cute example of red fluorescent protein production. But obviously that's not going to save the world. Uh, 
doing with that application. We'd like to now apply the same principles to and add some sophistication. Let's take the example here of making a small molecule. So again, this is a somewhat simple uh, example, but it'll give you the idea. So in this case, we build uh, our free enzyme metabolic pathway using a language the cell will understand. So that is adding a promoter, which is a part that the cell will recognize, okay, I'm going to express any sequence of DNA that's immediately downstream. And in this case, that would be an enzyme called ADOB. We do the same thing for another enzyme called HMGS, and then the same thing for a third enzyme called HMGR. So now we put this metabolic pathway at the DNA level in a format, in a language that the cell will understand, so it can produce those enzymes. So now we have an enzyme, ADOB enzyme, HMGS enzyme, and an HMGR enzyme. We can feed the cell this small molecule, and this enzyme will catalyze the reaction to convert this. It actually will take two of these and make this molecule, which will then be recognized by this enzyme to make this molecule, which then will finally be recognized by this enzyme to make our final product. So this works, but inevitably we run into some problems. So in this case, it works, but we have toxicity because we're building up a lot of this intermediate. So one solution to this problem would be to build in more regulation. Or simply, we can build a stronger, use a stronger promoter part. So this promoter will produce more enzyme than these other promoters will. So now we have many copies of this enzyme. So we will no longer accumulate this intermediate, but will produce lots of final products. So we took out that bottle and relieved the toxicity while also producing more of our final products. So think problems like this toxicity often arise because uh, properties of technology is taking enzymes that the cell never had seen before and making molecules that that cell, our production folk, had never made before. So it hasn't evolved to uh, deal with these high concentrations of these Molecules. There's a lot of synthetic biology applications that go into making pathways like this work better. And this is a simple three enzyme pathway, but you can imagine scaling that to much larger pathways, like 10, 15 enzyme pathways. The more sophisticated your final molecule is, the more enzymes you're likely to need to catalyze those reactions. Okay, so I've been using the example of E. coli as our production host for this talk. Uh, e. coli is probably still the most often used organism. Uh, there's many advantages to it. Uh, so it can be grown both in the presence of oxygen, or aerobic, or in the absence of oxygen, called anaerobic. Uh, that can be advantageous because we grow a lot of these cells in, in a really big fermenter. fermenter bigger than this room, and we grow them to a very high density. So there's many, many, many cells in that fermenter. Then it's actually hard to diffuse enough oxygen in uh, to that fermenter uh, for the cells to be eroded. So any, any process that's going to be grown at a really large scale has to be able to grow in the absence of oxygen. So E. coli uh, has that ability. It's very abundant in our large intestines. So you may have uh, maybe familiar with E. coli. I actually, the wild type strains are, are can be toxic and it can create a large problem. The strains we use in the lab have been neutered with all these uh, toxic virulent factors. So it's safe. It's, it's actually a a DSL one. It's biosafety level one organism, the most safe to work with. Uh, so it's, it's nice in the laboratory setting uh, for, for that as well. Uh, it does have, and it has, it has great engineering tools. So being able to get DNA into the cell, that's been worked out. That's very easy to do. Uh, we have a lot of parts that work in it because it's been the 
the most studied, most used organism. So those are its advantages. One of the uh, other organisms, by the second most often used organism, that uh, the hydrogen students will talk to you a bit about is yeast, baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So it also has many advantages. It's a simple single celled organism like, uh, like E. coli, but in this case, it's actually a eukaryote, which is more like our cells, means it has organelles. So that's what this picture on the right is showing. These are supposed to be different organelles. It also can be grown aerobically and anaerobically. Uh, one of its advantages is actually it's very resistant naturally to viruses, which you can imagine you're growing a large fermenter, a large, a large scale growth of your organism to make, let's say, a biofuel. You want to make sure you're not going to lose that whole fermenter to some pathogen for that microbe, some virus for that microbe. The yeast is naturally, doesn't naturally have nearly as many viruses that attack it as E. coli does. It's also hardy or robust to low pH and other chemicals, which can be advantageous. You can grow at a low pH, and a lot of uh, the bacterial contaminants that might grow in your fermenter uh, cannot grow at that low pH. So you can keep it relatively clean of contamination. Okay, so synthetic biology has the characteristics, I think you probably have appreciated by now, of uh, creating approaches for facilitating the programming in living cells, so we want to be able to program more, uh, bigger and better. It has a focus on regulation, so we can control when something's made, where it's made, uh, how much it's made. And to do this, often we're building multi-gene circuits, so multiple pieces of DNA put together. And we try to build those in a modular way. So think Lego. So we can put any, any two pieces of DNA together and still expect it to function. Uh, and to do this, we're obviously exploiting new DNA synthesis methods. So we're, we're getting much better at making these DNA parts and being able to assemble them together. And we're also employing parts that we get from a variety of different sources, so different organisms, uh, get enzymes from different uh, uh, different places. So I want to give you uh, some quick examples of projects. So one that you may have heard of in the news that came from uh, right here at Berkeley, Jay Kiesling's lab, was the uh, ability to synthesize, and they actually used E. coli, they separately used E. coli and yeast, uh, yeast is actually the one that's being commercialized now to produce a anti-malarial therapeutic artemisinin. So this is a wonder drug that you can treat malaria and uh, is naturally in a plant, artemisia annua, that's only grown in China. So it's not really a problem of producing it per se, but it's a problem that it's only produced in this one area of the world and that it's subject to different weather patterns. So a whole crop could be uh, wiped out if there's a, a really bad weather pattern that year. And the, the real emphasis is being able to produce this molecule very cheaply because most of the patients will be third world from third world countries and they can't afford uh, any therapeutic that's more than, more than a dollar or so. So the idea was use a microbe put in the enzymes that catalyze the reactions to ultimately produce that drug. And then you can scale up and grow many uh, fermenters that's large with, uh, with those uh, microchemical factors. To be able to do that, you obviously need to find the right enzymes to catalyze each of these reactions. You need to get them to work in your uh, yeast cell. You need to fine tune the expression levels as, as we discussed earlier. And in some cases, you may have enzymes that have very poor activities. You need to be able to make those enzymes have higher turnover activities with so more reactions per second. So this was highly successful. They're able to make this, and it's actually going to third world countries this year uh, for very, uh, very cheap cost. Another nice thing about it is the way the pathway was made 
these enzymes, they can actually go from this antimalarial therapeutic, artemisinin, they can take out two enzymes and replace it with one other enzyme, and now they make a molecule that looks like a good fuel that you could put in your car, Arnstein. So the spin-off company of JS Lab, uh, Amherst, is actually making this molecule uh, so it can be a jet fuel, you know, biodiesel. So another nice example is uh, the thought of, of using bacteria to seek out and then destroy tumors in the body. So uh, we've already seen the fact that cells can be naturally made to be very good at, at sensing and targeting uh, other cells in the body. Maybe we can do that with the bacteria, make it sense a a tumor, and when only when it senses that it's inside a tumor, does it produce a payload that will kill that tumor itself. Uh, so there's extreme challenges with doing that. I don't want to make that sound like this is a application that's, that's almost ready to be unveiled. This will take a long time to be able to accomplish. Uh, you probably appreciate that you need to be able to build the bacteria to first survive in the bloodstream. Uh, we have a great immune system for it bacteria because if they're used as pathogens for us. So if you try to inject a lab strain of E. coli in your blood right now, it would be catabolized in a matter of, of seconds to minutes. Uh, but you also, once you get it to survive, you also need to engineer it to do no harm, uh, to not cause sepsis uh, in the body. So that also would require a good deal of engineering. And, and some progress has been made on these fronts, but we're still a long way into the way. Uh, so this is work being done uh, by Chris Anderson at Markham here at Berkeley and Chris Boyd at MIT. I'm sorry, with the bacteria, sure. would, would, would it then stay there or should it have no of the tumor? Uh, the, at least the original design and thought would be that once it's, once it's killed the tumor, then it would it would, uh, uh, yeah, it would self-destruct, so that you wouldn't have loose bacteria floating around. So you can think, you can think along the lines of making probiotics. So your body used to eating yogurt as a probiotic, but you can start making those probiotics, uh, maybe produce vitamins, or produce some protein that, if you have a disease, you're lacking one protein, because you're lacking a protein, they can produce that protein. So there might be some uh, therapeutic application. Right, how many years off is it would the tumor killing bacteria be? Uh, I think tumor killing is probably the most ambitious application. That's probably <coughs> far enough away that it's hard to guess, like 30, 40 years. In probiotics for certain diseases, especially intestinal diseases, that might not be as far off. It might be like decades. Redesign and go through the cycle again. 
Okay, so uh, briefly I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to this undergraduate competition uh, called iGEM. Uh, so iGEM was created around the question, can simple biological systems be built from standard interchangeable parts and operate in living cells? Or is biology too complex to have a way of accomplishing this? So you obviously know my feeling is on the first part of the, the talk, but this was a real question, especially about a decade ago when we were embarking. Uh, there were a lot of naysayers for whether this could be accomplished, and it's still a Herculean task to get even simple uh, things to things that look simple on paper when you draw it out to function the way you expect it to function in the cell. Because there's a lot of a lot of things going on in the cell, a lot of chemistry, a lot of signaling in the cell, and we only have uh, scratched the surface of understanding of all of that, those processes. So iGEM has really grown over the years. So remember that first paper I showed you is in the 2000s, so that's when we were starting to think about uh, this is a new field. In 2004, there were five teams, and now there's over 200 teams, almost 250 teams. So it's rapidly expanded. Uh, it's expanded so much that we used to have the whole competition in this one room. In the end, and now we don't all fit. So we have to actually have a staggered competition. And much of that growth is because it's expanded from beyond just the United States to international. Each of those docs is a, a representative a team. Okay, so the process of iGEM uh, is, is this all one of the beautiful things about this is it all takes part in one summer and one fall. So our competition takes place in the end of October, beginning of November. So we start in the beginning of summer and we have to pick up a problem that we want to address. Then we do experiments in the lab, and that takes takes that summer and fall, beginning of fall. And then at the end, you build a website, so you can check out the web, you can check out their website uh, by googling Berkeley iGen 2012, and you'll get to this page. So that way they advertise what they did, and you can see any other iGen team from any of those years on the web as well. And then you write a poster. So it's a great experience for uh, the students to be able to take part in designing to designing a project around a problem they're interested in and see it go all the way from that design and experiment all the way to the website, poster, and a talk at MIT. And one of the other nice things is all these other students, uh, the other teams are doing the same thing. So they enjoy meeting each other and they can actually understand what each other is doing because they really learn a lot from this experience. Also, I want to uh, highlight, uh, are there any high school students in the room? All right, great. Uh, so there's also now a uh, high school competition uh, that, uh, that just went online, I believe, last year. Uh, so you might want to check that out as well. Okay, so I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just go through these really quick. Give you a flavor of what the, they're able to accomplish in these summer uh, projects. One of the first teams in 2006 that I like is building a varsity private center. So a real problem, and especially in India, is that many wells are inadvertently dug through arsenic veins, so the well water is contaminated with arsenic. And there's uh, about 100 million people uh, in India that are contaminated every year, and about 1 million of those die from cancer every year. So this team from Edinburgh wanted to use E. coli, and they built a, a pretty sophisticated genetic circuit that would sense all the way down to five parts per billion of arsenic, and then execute through the circuitry a response that lowers the pH. So then you could measure that lower pH and say, okay, this well water is contaminated with arsenic, you shouldn't drink it. In Cambridge, Cambridge in 2009, they had a really fun project they called e 
which they made in quite a way to produce molecules that have different colors. So this, you can imagine, plugging into this biosensor in 2006, so they made this biosensor before the e chromide. You can imagine instead of lowering the pH, you could make one of these colors. So it would be an even cheaper output that you could use in the third world or in uh, countries like India for, uh, for detecting whether you have arsenic contamination. So that's, it, it makes an output that's much, much cheaper to measure. MIT had a fun one in 2006 where uh, one of the bad things about E. coli is they stink. If you've ever worked with them. So they did a, a, a fun project where they produced wintergreen or banana smell. <laughs> so the bacteria smell good. And then they also deleted one of the uh, proteins that gives bacteria bad smell. Uh, Berkeley in 2007 had a project where they thought, what if we could make uh, bacteria cells that you can think of them as just bags of hemoglobin, so a synthetic red blood cell. The team that won this year was from uh, Roningen, where they made a circuit in a uh, bacterium that could sense a uh, molecule, volatile molecules are given off by rotten and meat. So they put these bacterium into a capsule with another compartment that has nutrients. So you break that, that barrier, so the nutrients mix with the, uh, with the bacteria, the bacteria starts growing, and then it'll produce a fluorophore if it's in the presence of that rotting meat of volatile molecule. Okay, so I will uh, hand it off to our, our iGen team to talk a little bit about their, uh, their projects in this last year. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, oh, excellent. Okay. So the concepts we've covered so far really go to show that the goal of synthetic biology is to make it easier for us to engineer cells with new capabilities. And when we design a new system using biological systems, we usually like to utilize certain basic features of cells. So we've covered some of these, but I just want to briefly go over them again. Here's a neutrophil example where the feature we might want to use is how the cell moves around in its environment. Another really cool feature of cells is how they're shaped. So many cells can form different shapes that allows them to interact differently with the cells in their environment. So here's an example of that. And another really cool example is actually how the intracellular contents of the cells can be organized to form different types of structures. So here we have yeast cells that have a different uh, fluorescent or colored proteins localized, as you can see, to the outer membrane of the cell. So even just from these three examples, we can really start to see a biology gives us many interesting and useful features with which to work. And we realize that if we're engineering a system that utilizes one of these features, one of the best ways to see if that system is actually performing our desired function is to be able to look at those cells directly. And we found that microscopy is actually a very powerful tool that can let us carry out this process or procedure. So a microscope, as you all know, is it's an instrument that can let us see objects that are much too small to be visualized by the eye. So using the power of microscopy, we can see how internal cellular organization is performed. We can see how different cells form networks with other cells in their vicinity. We can also see how cells may move around in their environment and be tossed to the ground in a different fashion based on the environmental factors present. So I thought we'd do a simple thought experiment of how we use microscopy to an analyze the system that we're trying to engineer. Now, in synthetic biology, we often know the starting point, which is maybe the genes we want to encode in DNA to carry out a particular function. And by extension of knowing the genes, we know which proteins they'll produce. But one of the problems that we sometimes run into is that we don't know how much of each protein we want to express. So the early example we covered with the metabolism, where we had expressed certain proteins in some ratio, but we gained toxicity. So we have to go back and add in more protein at a certain time point so that the toxicity could be alleviated. So similarly, if we're designing a new system, we usually want to try out certain settings in uh, different sample types. So let's say we start off with five cell types, where each cell type has some different setting of the genes and the proteins being expressed. What we'd currently do is, 
We take and prepare each of those individual samples separately. We would then visualize each cell type under the microscope, and if we like what we see, we would sequence the DNA. So this essentially acts as a verification method for finding out again and, uh, which uh, cells we just looked at. And if we like what we see after that, we're happy because the cells are carrying out the function we want. But rarely, if ever, do we find an optimal setting using just five cell types. What we actually have to go through is maybe somewhere on the order of five million cell types. And as you can probably imagine, if we were to try and go through this exact same workflow of analyzing each of those five million cell types one by one, we're not going to be happy anymore. <laughs> it will take much too long, it will be much too inefficient. So the problem we really tried to tackle this summer, and the, question, the central question we asked ourselves was, how can we retain the power of microscopy in letting us observe these features, but at the same time not be limited in the time it takes us to analyze ourselves? So one way to go about this is by mixing your set of population of cells on one microscope slide and viewing it under the microscope. So in this population of cells we see, the first one has, they're all varying by the level of red we see in the nucleus. Uh, so the first member of this population we see has a lot, very strong red seen in the nucleus. A second member may have uh, a weaker shade of red, and a third may have no red at all. So if we find a particular cell that we're interested in, say the one with a medium level of red, there's an inherent flaw. Well, we see that as the appearance shows that a medium level of red, we don't know the specific genetic manipulations that brought about this appearance. So the inherent, the inherent difficulty that we try to tackle this summer is the, the link, that the, there's no link between the identity, the genetic identity of the cell with its physical appearance. So to go about this, we create a system of barcodes. Now the system, this system of barcodes will link the specific genetic identity of the cell to its, uh, to its physical appearance. And to do this, to create these barcodes, we use uh, the unique property of yeast is that they have specific compartments within the cell called organelles. And so to create this barcode, we can vary the number of, uh, of fluorescent proteins, or colors we see in the cell, and the number of different places these proteins exist, or, uh, or within the organelles or compartments. And for our purposes, we use three different colors, red, green, and blue, and we use four different organelles. The cell periphery, the outside of the cell, the nucleus, the vacuum membrane and actin. So by varying different combinations of these organelles with different combinations of these colors, we can create an exponential increase in the number of barcodes that we can create. So now I'm showing you a cartoon example of how these barcodes uh, appear, but how do they look in real cells? So here are four examples um, out of the multitudes of barcodes we created. Uh, these barcodes are called mycodes or my microscopic barcodes. And as you can see, they each have a unique visual identity that allows them to be distinguished uh, from each other under a microscope based on the combination of colors and where the spatial organization or where these colors exist in the cell. So again, we, at this point, we've created this visual fluorescent barcode that's linking this specific genetic identity with the physical appearance that we're interested in the cell. So now that you guys have an idea of what you know, microscopic cellular barcodes look like, um, let's go back to a very quick uh, Example of the cartoon version. Say you have a microscope image um, of you know, several million cells, right? You want to identify all of them, and uh, you, you, you know you start out not knowing which cell you know corresponds to what contains what genetic material you put in. But right? so you look at this slide and you have all these colors. How exactly are we going to go through all of these cells, you know, in a reasonable amount of time and, ident and you know just have, uh, identify each barcode it has? Right, so the first idea you might think of is, you know, just go through it by eye. Scientists would go through all of these images and identify each individual barcode, and then, you know, from that barcode, be able to tell what that what genetic material that cell has. But of course, as you as you can see, this would take way much too long and much too laborious. Right. So as the second part of our project, we turn to kind of a computer automatable method in which we develop software to kind of uh, act as a barcode scanner for these cellular barcodes. Right? So instead of having, you know, instead of identifying, looking at the colors by eye, we would have we would feed images of the cells into a computer and have the computer do the, test, do the scanning for us. So essentially what you have is, you know, a series of images of cells and you feed them into a computer and we've written software that actually kind of, um, kind of detects um, 
in the image parts of the cell that are fluorescing, fluorescing different colors, and from there construct, um, reconstruct what the cellular barcode has and determine what that genetic material is. So essentially, what we, as a second part of our project, we've developed kind of a barcode scanner to use for these microbes. We first tested our bike out codes out with two different types of cells. Cells that show green, uh, that show red everywhere in the cell, and cells that show red only in a certain organelle. We link them to mycodes. And so if the cell showed red in only one organelle, it had a blue membrane and green nuclei mycode. And if they showed red everywhere, they showed a green membrane and blue nuclei mycode. And so you can see. Uh, without looking at the, um, the slide on the right, uh, you can tell which mycode um, the cells are. And while this is very, uh, it doesn't show very much in this, uh, with just two types of cells, but if we scale it up to more cells, uh, this uh, type of mycoding becomes very useful, as you will see in my next slide. So during our project, we began a collaboration with a lab at MIT, the heating lab. And what they do is they uh, computationally design uh, genes on the computer. And when we put these genes in our cells, if they interact with each other, they will give us red and only one organelle. However, if they don't interact, they will show red everywhere. And so we uh, put these genes into our cells. And um, we, so we have a lot of different genes, and we mix and match them to get, uh, just test out all the different combinations of the genes. And with each combination of gene, we attach a specific mycode. And so you can see, uh, when we have, uh, when we put them on the slide, we have lots of cells that don't have interacting genes. So you can see all the cells with the red everywhere. But we do see a couple, uh, two cells here at least, that have red only in one organelle. And those are the genes that we are, those are the cells that we are interested in because they show that the genes interacted. And so we can go back to the mycode. And from that mycode, we can figure out uh, what genes made that interaction. So in summary, mycodes allowed us to uh, see from the physical output on the right what genes or genetic information caused that output. We'd like to thank, uh, so during the summer, a lot of people helped us out with our project. Uh, we'd like to thank Agilent Technologies for the financial support. Sinberg and the SinBio Institute for their administrative help, the Duber Lab for supporting us and answering all our questions, and the Keating Lab for their collaboration. Don Duber and us on the team would love to answer any questions you have. Thank you for your time.
measure the barcode in the cell is three dimensional instead of being flat. So for our measurements that they were doing, uh, they were doing just simple live field comparisons, which doesn't take into account, uh, which which would take a whole image. You actually can do an image that would make this barcode at much higher resolution. That's a microscopy technique called confocal microscopy that is able to just take a slice, and then you have all that information. They call, it's called z-stacking. You can take several slices, images of slicing as it goes up and down, and then you can reconstitute exactly what the cell looks like in three dimensions. So that will tell you a very clean, high-resolution picture. We weren't doing that because that takes more time, uh, but that would be a way of getting higher Images and going to more organelles so you can get a more, a more sophisticated barcode and higher numbers in your library. What they were doing, you're right, that uh, it's three dimensions, so we were sacrificing some of that resolution because we can still see it by, by eye and by Thomas's algorithm. But yeah, the, the, uh, the analogy is simply meant to be that analogy, not in detail, but the ability to link. A program of DNA that we're introducing with some some visual code that we can say that cell has this gene like, or has that program, that cell has this other program. When you're using enzymes, how do you know which enzyme to use to catalyze a specific reaction? Okay, so the question is. When using enzymes, how do you know what's the right enzyme to use for your pathway to, to catalyze your reaction? Right? That's a great question. Uh, there's, there's actually a lot of work being done in characterizing enzymes by scientists, not just synthetic biologists, but scientists. And as uh, people are people are going to the oceans and sequencing lots of, of DNA from different Small molecule, small organs, things of organisms in the ocean. They're going to tropical rainforests, and there's a lot of biodiversity of organisms there. So we're rapidly increasing the number of enzymes in our database as well. And I would say there's a huge backlog for characterizing all of them. Right now, most of them are done by a work called homology, saying the sequence of this enzyme looks similar to this other enzyme, and we've already measured what this other enzyme does. So a lot of it's done by inference of guessing, because this looks a lot like this other enzyme. It probably does that same reaction. Whether it recognizes the same substrate, the same starting molecule, that's another question as well. And I think a lot more characterization needs to be done. Uh, what has been done so far is all cataloged in websites. There's one called Brenda, B-R-E-N-D-A, like the, the woman's name. And you can see many, many, many enzymes uh, characterized for what reaction it will catalyze. So we do put it, when we characterize it, we do put it in a, in a site where everyone can look it up. But there's a lot of enzymes out there we don't know what they do. So that's a great question. question. John, my question relates to the search for life out there. And you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that to do synthetic biology, you need to get your hands wet. And it's the wetness element, the presence of liquid water as a, uh, an essential ingredient for life. Is it possible from your perspective or your student's perspective that life could exist in the absence of liquid water? So the question is, uh, everything we've talked about, water is necessary, uh, necessary component. Uh, can you visual, uh, envision a world without water where life would still exist? Uh, it sounds like you really need to go to the next talk. It sounds like that. <laughs> the talk you really uh, Yeah, the way in life works on Earth, no. Uh, it, it would have to be a a life form that needs a completely different chemistry than what we, we use. Uh, I'm not a, uh, it's out of my, my area, so I don't know if that's infeasible that it could have different chemistry. But the way life works here, you definitely need water. It's amazing where life does live on Earth. You can, you can make do with very little water, but it still needs some, or you can live in extremely high temperatures or low 
temperatures, the absence of light. So there's a light on the way to work in many different conditions. But to my knowledge, you need at least a little water to do some of the chemistry that's required. Uh, in the back of red. Here, 
but a version that is photoactivatable by UV light. So you only get that light up if you first shine it with UV light. So you can take an image, see where all your colors are, then shine UV light and see what additional places of that color light up. And that's another way of getting increased complexity in the bar. How difficult is it to make these barcodes? Can it become just something you routinely do whenever you're making your programming that you're interested in making for your desired application? Just link that automatically to a, a barcode. Uh, Robert was the one who made uh, the biggest library of barcodes, so I'll let him answer that. So uh, it does take uh, additional effort. But it's done at the same step as when you put in the genetic information. So you have you put in both the genetic information and the barcode, but um, you just make them at the same time and put them in together. So it doesn't take an extra step. It just takes um, a kind of a something you do in the, at the same time. So Robert's modestly saying that uh, if you do it in Paris, it takes an extra extra effort on Robert's part. It doesn't take extra. Effort. He values time more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, if there are no more questions, uh, again, please come back next month. Uh, I'd like to thank Chris Klein, who's been doing our videos for us here. That should be up on the web during the next few days if you want to share that around. Uh, and again, thanks to Kate Spore and Stenberg, and thanks to Professor Duber and, and the team of the press here. Thanks.